In this video, I'm gonna give you my full review and a tutorial for the new ZWO AM5. And as you can see, this is probably one of the smallest and most portable go-to mounts on the market. It is a harmonic drive, which we'll get into later, but basically that means you don't have to worry about counterweights or balancing or anything like that. And it keeps the entire mount much smaller and lighter. Another benefit of using the AM5 for Astro is that it can be controlled entirely with your ASI Air Plus or Pro or whatever you have. And that's really one of the features I'm most looking forward to. Now, of course, you can control most mounts with the ASI Air Plus software, but it just works really well with this particular mount and it streamlines your entire workflow at night. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, we're gonna go through the setup process for the AM5. As you're gonna see, it's very simple. And if you do this once or twice, you'll be good to go. Then we'll go through the ASI Air portion. And then finally, I'll give you my review and we'll see how this compares to something like the EQ6R Pro or some of the other mounts out there. Let's start off by comparing the size of the new AM5 with my older Skywatcher EQ6R Pro. As you can see right here, the AM5 is noticeably smaller and more compact than the other mount. That's because the AM5 is a harmonic mount compared to a traditional equatorial mount. And what that means is you don't actually need any counterweights for the AM5, which is pretty cool. Now in terms of the overall weight of the unit, the EQ6R Pro is very heavy. And in fact, you can very easily injure yourself trying to take this outside or up the stairs or anything else. So this is not an ideal mount to take with you on any sort of trip. The AM5 on the other hand though, is much smaller, lighter, and really I could pick it up with one hand, no problem. The AM5 also comes with a very nice portable carrying case, which you can see here on top of that Pelican case, just to show you the size difference. And everything you need will fit in that small black case, except for the tripod. Right there you can see the indent for the mount. On the other hand, we have my much larger Pelican case. The case alone weighs probably 20 pounds. And then when you throw in the mount in there, along with the counterweights, this thing is a nightmare to take anywhere with you. Next up, I want to draw your attention to the two clutches on the EQ6R Pro. Virtually every equatorial mount will have these two clutches. The first is the right ascension, which when you loosen it, you can turn it kind of up and down like this. And this would be how you balance the counterweight and the telescopes and everything else. That's the right ascension clutch. And you can always tighten it down to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Then we have the declination clutch up top, which can also be used for balancing, which is important. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the AM5 and any other harmonic mount out there does not have a manual clutch for the right ascension or the declination. In other words, there's no way to actually balance your telescope on this mount. And this is just a design of the harmonic mounts in general, whether you get it from ZWO, Rainbow Astro, or any other manufacturer. And this is getting a bit beyond my expertise, but these harmonic mounts have very powerful motors and drives and things and so the engineers don't seem too concerned that you can't actually balance your telescope properly. But I still think that seems to be a bit odd. And I would personally like the ability to balance things out, but it's just the way these harmonic mounts are built. You can't really do it anymore. Although the AM5 does have a counterweight rod insertion point right here. If you take out this screw, you can install a counterweight rod and then attach a counterweight. But again, there's no way to loosen any clutches and balance it. So it really might not be that beneficial. Let's move on now to the altitude adjustments here. You can go from zero to 90 degrees, no problem. And I have to say, the altitude adjustments are super smooth and easy to do. This is a really nice change from the EQ6R Pro. And anybody who's used that mount will tell you just how much of a pain it is to do any sort of altitude adjustments because the screw handle here is really poorly designed and it's a nightmare to do your alignments at night with it. Eventually though, you do get used to this really messed up handle and you can work around it. But I gotta say, after dealing with this thing for over a year now, I was really excited to see just how much better the altitude screw is on the AM5. Let's go through the full setup process now for the AM5. It's actually very simple. We'll start off by pulling our mount out of the hard case here, and then we'll install it right into the tripod. And I do recommend that you use the tripod from ZWL because the two pair together perfectly. Once you've seated it here inside the tripod, make sure you tighten down that screw right there. Once it's tightened down, that will prevent the mount from accidentally falling off or getting loose or anything like that. Then we'll grab this little screw, whatever you want to call it, 
thread it up through the bottom. That way it'll also secure the mount to the tripod. Then we'll grab our little spacer here for the tripod again. And then finally grab the little handle here and screw it all together so it's nice and tight. This just makes sure the tripod stays nice and stable all night long. The only downside of doing all this is that you'll have to take off the spacer and that screw to break down the tripod if you're going to be doing any sort of traveling. After you've gotten your mount connected to the tripod, then you can attach the ASIR Plus if you have one. It should just slide onto this little finder shoe here on the side. And this is my recommended way to do things. Because with the ASIR Plus, you can control every function of the mount, your camera, the filter wheel, and more, all through your smartphone or tablet. There is a standalone application for free that you can use to control the mount, but that's pretty basic and I wouldn't really recommend it as of the recording of this video. So I still recommend that everybody use the ASIR Plus or Pro whenever possible. One of the great little features of the AM5 is that it has a 12 volt output right here on the side of the unit. Now I can power my ASIR Plus directly through the AM5. I don't need a second battery. However, I ran into a problem where my standard uh, power cable here was running into the ASIR Plus. So there's two different ways you can work around this. The first is just to grab a right angle cable like you see here. And if you plug that into the power output, it really shouldn't interfere with the ASIR Plus. Or you can take off the little Vixen plate here from the bottom of the ASIR Plus and then put it on the top or the side. And you can see those holes right here. So once you've attached the Vixen plate to that part of the ASR Plus, you can reattach it, and again, you shouldn't have those problems anymore, especially if you have that right angle cable. And that's all there is to it. You've now powered the ASR Plus. Next, we can connect our 12 volt power cable to our battery. Once we plugged in the one end to our battery, we'll plug the other end into the input on the AM5, which you can see right here. So now we're powering the AM5 and the ASR Plus off that single battery. With your power cables attached and the battery turned on, you can click the power button here on the side. When you hear that beep, that means you're good to go. Then I'd recommend you go to the ASAR Plus and make sure you turn that on now as well. Just one less thing to do later. At this point, we've powered both devices and now we can attach our telescope to the mount. I'm using a very small, lightweight setup today. The SpaceCat telescope and the ASI 533 monochrome camera along with my filter wheel. And this is gonna be the same as any other mount. Just tighten down the screws. And before you let go, make sure you give it the wiggle test, make sure it's not gonna fall off and break. It's always a little scary. But there we go, we've attached our camera gear. Now we can begin attaching our cables between the camera, the ASA Air, and the mount. We'll start off with the USB connection from the ASA Air Plus to the AM5. And I just connect a USB 2.0 cable between the two, like you see here. That way the two can communicate without any issues. Next up, we'll grab a USB 3.0 cable, plug that into the back of our camera, and then plug the other end into the ASR Plus. For those that are still using DSLRs, I'd still recommend that you control your DSLR manually, not through the application. So keep that in mind. You'll also want to connect a power cable from your camera to one of the four ports on the ASR Plus that way you can turn on the cooling system inside the application. I normally plug this into the slot labeled number one, but you could do whatever you want. And just to be thorough, there's also a USB cable connected between my filter wheel and the back of my camera. And this allows me to still control the filter wheel through the ASR Plus. Then we have our auto guider. We'll connect USB-C cable from the back of the auto guider into one of the 2.0 ports on the ASR Plus. And as I do this, you'll see that the ASA Air actually falls out of the slot right there. That's because I'm still using that old power cable, which is getting in the way. And that's why I did some testing and I found that if you use that right angle cable, that solves the problem. So I'd recommend that everybody do that same trick. The AM5 does come with its own hand controller, which can be used to control the mount itself. And the hand controller also generates the Wi-Fi signal so you can communicate with the AM5 through your smartphone. And then if you use the joystick here, you can manually move the mount left, right, up, down, whatever. However, if you have the ASR Plus, the hand controller is redundant, and it's actually just going to get in the way of things. So if you've been following along with me step by step and you've got an ASI Air, I'd actually recommend you unplug the hand controller and leave it in the house. You won't need it for today's workflow. 
And that's all there is to it. We've now completed the setup process for the AM5. There's still a lot more to do, including your pole alignment, getting the guiding set up, finding the object, and more. We'll cover that later on in the video. At this point though, I want you to use either the hand controller or the ASI Air software to move the mount around freely like I'm showing here in the video. The reason we're doing this is to make sure that our cables are long enough and they're not gonna get snagged, or maybe you have a large heavy telescope here on the mount. It's possible that it might bang into one of your tripod legs if you don't have a pure extension. And now would be the time to run through all this and find any problems before it gets dark and things start running automatically. But if you verify that everything looks good, you can return the mount to the home position and then we're ready for the rest of the workflow. Before we get into the ASI Air workflow, I want to demo the AM5 software just so you can see why you probably don't want to use it. To start off with, we'll go to our phone's Wi-Fi settings, connect to the AMH Wi-Fi network here. If you don't see that, you have to connect the hand controller to the AM5 because that's what generates the Wi-Fi signal. Then we can start up the AM5 app on our phone right here and then go through the initial setup location. If you run into a problem like I did, you'll have to manually enter your latitude and longitude, which can be kind of a pain. There's a lot of different ways you can figure this information out. One way that I like to do this is through an application called the Photographer's Ephemeris. And right there in the upper right corner, you can see my current latitude and longitude. Now that I've got a rough idea of where I'm located, I can plug in those numbers here in the application. And this just ensures that the mount knows where it's located so it can do its plate solving and more. After you've dialed in your latitude and longitude, just double check that the hemisphere is set correctly, in my case, east and north. And now we're in the main user interface right here. This is very similar to the Sky Atlas, which was recently added to the AS Air Plus software. However, I think this version is quite a bit worse. There's a lot of distracting elements going on, and even the foreground there is just really bright and distracting. So for that reason, I don't really recommend using this application unless you really need to. In terms of the settings, well, there's not much there either. You can control the tracking speed, you can make it go to the home position, and that's about it to be honest. Although, if you need to update the firmware or check any of the more advanced features, you'll find that in the hand controller manage system button right here. And again, this is where you control the firmware, set up some of the other Wi-Fi things and more. I've been running into a problem though, where when I try to update my firmware on the mount, it's giving me some unknown error. And I don't want to risk bricking the unit, so I'm not going to mess with this too much until they release some sort of patch for this problem. Anyway, that's the AM5 hand controller menu here. Just another way to update the firmware mount if you need to. But beyond that, there's really not much settings in the AM5. You can control some of the views there, and that's about it. So for all these different reasons, I really don't recommend using the AM5 app to control the mount. It's pretty basic as of right now, and you're not gonna get much value out of it. You'd be much better off using the AS Air Plus, which we're gonna look at next. To start off with, let's go to our phone's Wi-Fi settings and then connect to the AS Air Plus Wi-Fi network here. If you don't see it, make sure the AS Air is turned on. Then we can start up the AS Air app on our smartphone or tablet. Next, we're going to make sure that we've chosen the mount, in this case, the ZWO AM5 near the top. Then we have our main camera and guide camera. I'm using the 533 monochrome camera, which has been doing a really nice job, and the ASI 120 mini, which does an okay job. That's really all there is to it here, besides the main scope focal length. And now we're in our main user interface. If this is one of your first few times using the application, you might be a bit overwhelmed, so I'm gonna walk you through my personal workflow. We'll start off by taking a three second long exposure, ideally with a bat knob mask on the front of our telescope. And what we wanna do is make sure that the telescope is focused. With the help of this diffraction spike pattern caused by the bat knob mask, we can really get the stars as sharp as possible. And by taking these three second long exposures, we're not gonna waste a lot of time. So basically I turn my focus ring slightly in one direction and I take another photo. If I went in the wrong way, or I went too far, then I move the focus ring a bit further and take another photo. This just takes a lot of practice and very small, precise adjustments on your focus ring. Eventually though, you'll get it where the diffraction spike looks correct, and we see that right here. 
The spike is right in the middle. That looks great. Then we can zoom out just by pinching with our fingers and we'll make sure to remove the bat knob mask before we go any further. Because if you leave that on there, it's gonna cause problems for the rest of the workflow. So pull off that bat knob mask, come back to the ASR Plus, and it doesn't hurt to take one last photo. This just makes sure the stars are sharp, there's no more diffraction spike, and we're good to go. That's step one. Then we'll click where it says Preview and click on PA for Polar Align. And the great thing with the AM5 is that this entire process is pretty well automated. What we'll do is click on the play button over on the right. That will begin the sequence. What's gonna happen is that it's gonna take a photo with our telescope and camera, and it's gonna plate solve. It's gonna identify all the stars and get an idea of where it's aimed at. Then we click on next, but you gotta be careful because when you click on next, your mount is gonna start moving quite quickly actually. That's why I went into my phone's menu and turned on the flashlight because I wanna make sure that the mount isn't gonna crash or the cables aren't gonna get stuck. So I have that flashlight turned on while the mount's moving just to avoid any problems. The mount has successfully moved over, taken another photo, and then it says, let's go. We've now made it to the main polar alignment interface, and this is where it's gonna tell us how far off our alignment is. Over there on the right, we see a few different numbers. It says up two degrees, 47 minutes, 42 seconds. That means I need to move my mount upwards quite a bit. Then I have to move to the right one minute and one second, which is hardly anything. So I'm not really worried about that. What we need to do then is go to our mount and use the altitude knob here to move the mount upwards, just like the application told us. Then we come back to the application and click the refresh button there in the lower right. This will cause the camera to take another photo and it will update that error with some new values. It looks like I did some good adjustments, but I didn't go far enough. I still need to move the mount upwards one degree, two minutes, 21 seconds. So what that means is I go back to the mount, I keep turning that altitude knob to move the mount upwards, then I come back to the application and click on refresh again. It will take another photo and give us another new set of values. Most likely you will have some error in terms of the left and the right, and for that you'll need to adjust the azimuth screws on your tracker. These are kind of weird, but the way it works is you turn both screws at the same time in the same direction, either towards you or away from you. And when you turn them at the same time, that should move the mount either left or right. If it doesn't seem to be moving, then make sure you loosen both these screws here on the side of the AM5. Now when you turn the screws, it should actually move things left and right. So you make your adjustments, go back to the app, click on refresh, and just keep doing the same thing over and over again until the error is as small as possible. And then when you're done, make sure you tighten down those screws back on the sides to prevent any problems later on in the night. Anyway, now that you know what to do, you adjust your azimuth and altitude screws, keep clicking refresh, and when the error is, I would say, five arc minutes or less, then you've done a really good polar alignment, and we can move on with the rest of the workflow. And on my first night with the AM5, I managed to get a really good polar alignment in just two minutes. That goes to show you that with a lot of practice and some nice smooth controls on the mount itself, you can do your polar alignment very easily without even having a polar scope, which is something I should have mentioned earlier, I forgot about it. The AM5 does not have a built-in polar scope or a laser pointer, at least the one I got doesn't. So I just wanted you to be aware that the AM5 does not have a built-in polar scope like most of the equatorial mounts do, and therefore you will need something like the ASAR Plus to do your polar alignment. All right, let's get back on track. We'll click on PA and then change it back to preview. This is our main user interface right here. And I'm gonna click on that telescope icon towards the top of the screen. These are our mount settings. And inside of here, you should see the option if you scroll down to go to home position and then there's a start button. I'm gonna do that because I want the mount to go back to its original orientation with the telescope pointing up towards Polaris, just like so. I also need to mention that you have to put the mount back to the home position at the end of the night before you turn off the power and pack everything up, because if it's left at some weird angle, there's no way to manually get it back to start like you could with an equatorial mount. So that's something you always gotta remember. Anyway, we're gonna take another quick three second photo just to get our bearings, and now we're ready to find the object that we want to photograph. This is one of my favorite features in the ASIR. What you're gonna do is click on that little icon in the lower left with the Big Dipper, 
this brings up the sky atlas window right here. That blue square, that's where your telescope is currently aimed up at, which is pretty neat. You can see exactly where your camera is aiming. Now, if I click and drag with my finger along the screen, I now see a red square as well. This is where I want the camera to move to. And if you know the night sky, you can pretty quickly find the nebula or galaxy you want to photograph. If you're not that familiar with the night sky though, then you might want to use the search function, which you should see a magnifying glass on the left. That'd be one way to do it. But I do recommend that you learn the night sky so you can figure out where these objects are. And then you can zoom in to get even closer, get a really nice composition with the help of the planner right here. And once you've got your composition looking however you want, click that button over there on the far right that says go to cross. Now your mount is going to start moving towards this location. And while it's doing this, again, it's possible that the telescope could run into the tripod, the cables could get snagged or something else. That's why I told you to look things over earlier in the night before it got dark. Anyway, once the mount has moved over, we should now see that the blue square is where we intended it to be, in this case on the Veil Nebula. I want to make sure though that it's actually where it says it is. I mean it should be, but it's always a good idea to double check. For this, I'll click on my filter wheel settings at the top of the screen and change the position from my luminance filter to my H alpha filter because the Veil Nebula is mainly H alpha and oxygen data. And because these narrowband filters are so dim, they block a lot of light, I need to take a five minute long test photo. I mean, I don't have to, but I like to do it anyway, especially if I've got time to kill before it actually gets completely dark. When the five minute photo completes, we can pinch and zoom into the photo, and there we see the Veil Nebula with the same exact composition that we chose earlier in the Sky Atlas. It really is pretty amazing how all this technology just works together. I want you to look over the image one more time and make sure the composition looks good. You should also zoom out to get the full view. And if you're happy, we can move on with the workflow. If not though, go back to the Sky Atlas and redo your composition. Moving on, we'll click on the guide button over on the left. That'll bring up a pop-up window. And when we click on that, we'll be in the guiding interface next. From here, it's very easy. Click the begin looping arrows over on the right, and now your auto guider will begin taking photos. Hopefully, your stars are sharp and you can actually see them. If so, click on that begin guiding crosshair over on the right, and now it's gonna go through and do its calibration. This should take about five minutes, but it's all automated, so you shouldn't have to worry about it. Therefore, what I'm gonna do is click on the two arrows in the top left corner to go back to our main shooting interface. The reason I'm doing this is just to streamline the workflow. So while that guiding calibration is running, I'll click where it says preview and change it to auto run. This is actually how we take photos with our dedicated astro cameras. Inside the auto run menu, click the button on the right with the three dots and the three lines. This is where we're gonna configure our shooting schedule. We can tell the camera to take our different photos with different shutter speeds. But we're gonna start off by renaming the target here, which will change the file naming and the folder name as well. I'd recommend just calling this whatever you're photographing, in my case, the Veil Nebula. All right, we've got our name figured out. And because the 533 doesn't need dark frames, I'm gonna delete that original sequence and start over. We'll click on that big plus button, and this is where we can configure our camera settings. First up, we have the type, light, bias, flat, or dark. I'm assuming we're all taking light frames to start off with. The exposure, that's gonna be how many seconds you want the photo to be, in this case, five minutes long. The filter, I'm gonna start off with H alpha. And then for the number of photos, if I click that box with a slash through it, I can enter any value I want. Today, I'll do about 13 photos, each five minutes long with the H alpha filter. Then I'll hit okay. I also wanna take a set of oxygen images though. So I'll click on the plus button again. I'll change the filter to oxygen. And this time I'll take maybe 15 images just to be safe and then I'll hit okay. That's all there is to it. I really only need two filters to get a color photo. If you look in the lower left, you should see an option to shut down ASI Air and go to home position. I'd recommend you turn on both of those. What that's gonna do is just move the ASI Air back to that original orientation up towards Polaris and turn everything off at the end of the night. And this can really help you out if you accidentally fall asleep while you're shooting because now the mount's gonna go back to the starting position and turn off and you don't have to worry about it crashing to the ground or anything else. We should probably go back and check on our guiding. We can do that by clicking the graph right there. 
that immediately brings us to the guiding interface where we can catch up on all the different things going on. And right now it looks like we still have our dotted yellow lines, which means the calibration is still running. As I said, it's pretty well automated, but there we go, it finally finished. If it's working correctly, we should begin to see a red and a blue line on the graph. The red corresponds to the declination axis, the blue to the right ascension axis. And usually at the start, the lines will be pretty crazy, but after the span of about 10 seconds to a minute, things will really start to calm down and your total error will drop considerably. That's why I'd recommend you hit the clear button in the lower left hand corner to clear out that graph after about 10 or 20 seconds so it looks a little bit more realistic. And while you're running this, I want you to go inside the house or at the very least get away from your tripod because even if you're just walking around out there, it's possible you're shaking things very slightly and messing with the guiding. Or if there's a bit of a breeze, that could also cause some problems here on the graph. As I mentioned earlier though, you want to let this run for about a minute or two so things can get working into an equilibrium then we can begin taking our photos. And you'll see right now that my total error is just over one arc second, which is actually really good. That means I can easily shoot five minute long exposures without any trailing whatsoever, even at an effective focal length of close to 700 millimeters. Your guiding might not be as accurate, and that could be because there's some gusts of wind, or again, you're out there shaking the tripod, or a lot of other factors. But if you wanna learn more about guiding, I've got a lot of videos on this in my deep space course over on how to, which I'd recommend you check out if you want to learn more. And I've also got a lot of free videos here on YouTube for more info. Anyway, if the guiding looks good, we'll click on the two arrows on the top left corner to get out of this interface, and then we can begin taking our photos through the auto run menu. There is one other thing you want to check before you begin taking your photos. And for this, we'll click on the camera icon up at the top of the screen that brings up our camera settings. The cooling system needs to be turned on with a target temperature, usually around minus four. Fahrenheit or I think minus 20 Celsius maybe. Either way, that will keep the sensor nice and cool, which will drastically decrease the amount of noise in your final photo. This is also where you can adjust the ISO or the gain of your camera. And I normally leave mine around 100 to 200. To be honest, it really shouldn't matter all that much, unless you're photographing a really bright object like the moon, which in that case you'd want to lower the gain to probably zero. We can now finally begin taking our photos by clicking that circular button over on the right inside of the auto run menu. This will begin the series that we set up earlier, five minute long photos with H alpha and then five minute long photos with oxygen. Everything is automated though. So now you can go in the house, relax, do whatever you want, but I would recommend you at least wait five or 10 minutes for your first one or two photos to complete. Then you come back to your smartphone, your tablet, zoom in and verify the stars are sharp. For those of you that are going to stay up and watch the progress, the easiest thing to double check along with the image sharpness is the guiding. Because if you see some problems on your graph, that indicates maybe that there's a breeze or maybe even a cable got snagged, whatever it might be. Either way, the graph here will indicate problems before anything else. If you see a lot of big spikes, something's going wrong. And that'll give you an opportunity to go out there and figure out what it is as soon as possible. But yeah, normally I just let this thing run. I check my photos every few minutes to make sure they're sharp. I can always pinch and zoom to make them as big as possible. And if you are shooting a narrow band, it's gonna be pretty amazing when that first photo completes because you're gonna see a lot of detail that you might not be expecting, especially of something like the Veil Nebula right here. Before we end tonight's tutorial, there's one other thing I need to mention. At the end of the night, you always wanna make sure you put the mount back to the home position because this is a harmonic mount. If you set everything up the way I showed you, this will happen automatically. If not, go up to the telescope icon and click the go to home position button. That should move everything back up towards Polaris. And then once it's aimed up there, you can turn off the power on the mount, the SAR, your battery, etc. Unplug all your cables, and you've now successfully completed your first night with the AM5. I hope this tutorial has helped you out and you've learned a lot along the way. There are a few little things I missed along the way, and that's why I'd recommend you check out some of the other AM5 tutorials over on YouTube. Those should fill in any gaps I might have missed. For more information on deep space astrophotography, be sure to check out my deep space course over on HowTube. This course has over 90 videos that cover the setup process, the post-processing, camera settings, and more. Or you can always check out some of my other free videos here on YouTube. There's plenty to watch. So that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.